on time. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Hadi Hajibegi from TU Delft. It's my great pleasure and honor to chair this session. It's an invited session. We are delighted to have Professor Sherwin Bakari from KTH here. Sherwin, uh, I'm going to introduce him in a, in a second. Uh, and then we will get some sort of also instructions about how this invited uh, lecture is going through, uh, which is also to be followed by a pitch by a, a, a company sponsor as well. Sherwin's research focuses on the interaction between flowing fluids and complex materials across different length and time scales, ranging from molecular aspects of triple phase contact lines to turbulent flows of porous medium. His main objective is to apply this understanding to design new surfaces and materials to control and sense flows and particles suspended in fluids. Sherwin graduated in fluid mechanics at Royal Institute of Technology, KTH, in Stockholm in 2010. In 2017, he was appointed as Wallenberg Academy Fellow and received the Future Research Leader Award by the Swiss Swedish Foundation for Strategic Research, SSF. Since 2020, he is a member of the Young Academy of Sweden. It's our great pleasure and honor to host you, Sherwin, here today with us in this fascinating conference that has been great so far. And we are all looking forward to hearing your lecture. Please. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, I guess you guys hear me. Uh, thanks, Hadi, uh, for the in kind introduction, and also thank you to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to uh, to talk to you guys. It's very nice. Uh, I think this is a very broad audience and many different backgrounds, so I'm quite excited to to present our work to you. Right. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is liquid infused systems, and um, we can define the systems as organized liquid-liquid interfaces locked in into structured media, usually through capillary forces. So just to give you a few examples, one type of, uh, of liquid infused system is a liquid infused surface, LIS, where we have a microstructure that locks in a liquid, which we call a lubricant. And above this lubricant, we have a second liquid, for example, water. So you can think of the lubricant as oil, and the second liquid, liquid as water. And this was introduced around 2011 by, by these two groups, as you can see at the bottom. Now, another type of liquid infused system is liquid infused material. This is more a recent invention. And here we have a 3D poor scaffold where we have locked in spherical droplets. So here we, we basically can create different shapes of interfaces in poor scaffolds and, and, and um, use these kind of materials for different purposes. So I'm going to start off talking about LIMs a little bit and then move on to LIS. I'm going to focus mostly on surfaces today because we have done most of our work on that. And, you know, that's also a more dynamic problem we can, which I'm going to talk about where, where the central aspect is fluid mechanics, right? We are not there yet with LIMs, although we're going to start soon uh, to look at in this material, which I think have a huge potential. So let's start to look at these LIMs. Basically what we do is we create a poor scaffold of a particular geometry. So we get trapping zones. And here, for example, we have kind of a octahedra type of trapping zones. You can see from the side view and from the top view, you can also see that there are channels in the porous material that allows for, for a sort of unobstructed flow through the, through the uh, material. So given this geometry with these so-called trapping zones, basically what we do to create droplets is to infuse it with a primary liquid, uh, as you can see at the first step there. And then at the second step, we fill it with a second liquid, right? So the second liquid the idea is that the second liquid would displace the first liquid everywhere except in the trapping zones. So it's a very simple idea. And it's very also scalable. So to the right, we have created uh, 45,000 droplets in a very scalable way. And of course, we can do things with these materials that I will show you in a minute. So uh, having this type of materials, um, 
there's one thing in addition to the geometry which we need to get right, and that is the chemistry. So the wettability has also be matched, right? So if we now look at some uh, uh, unit cells, this is an experimental, uh, this is a picture of just uh, one unit cell. And if we take now, to, uh, if we look at the capillary number based on the velocity of the secondary fluid, so the invading fluid's velocity, if the capillary number is low and the viscosity ratio is order one, and the wettability or the contact angle also with respect to the invading uh, fluid, the second fluid, is less than 90 degrees, we basically have inhibition, right? So the second fluid uh, displaces the primary fluid everywhere. Now, if the contact angle is large in 90 degrees, we have draining, right? So the second fluid will find some channels to, to, to go through and leaves behind the primary fluid essentially in most part of the material. Now, in between, we can capture these, these structures that I talked about, for example, in like a diamond shape structure, which is pinned inside these trapezoids, right? So you need to have around uh, like a weak inhibition conditions, contact angles around 90 degrees. Also, we can play around with the capillary number to create other shapes in the same scaffold. So having a capillary number slightly larger, uh, well, quite large, we can create a time scale of which the second fluid is pushed through the material, and thus we can create trapped uh, liquid. For example, we can create a spherical shape liquid uh, of the primary fluid. So there we have a partial displacement of the primary fluid from the secondary fluid. So getting the geometry and the chemistry right in create these materials, or oh, I should mention that this work has been mainly done by the group of uh, uh, Walter um, at KTH, he's a professor in nano and uh, microsystems, and also by his students, Emre and Hiroki. So having uh, these LIMs, we can do different things with them. One of the things we can do is soft composites like actuators or tunable filters, you can imagine that you lock in a temperature sensitive polymer, right, which in the cold state is quite large. So we have large droplets and in the warm state or in the hot state, these, these uh, droplets shrink, right? So we can basically tune the porosity of these materials by changing the temperature. Now, other things we can do is to lock in particles with lipid bilayers uh, to mimic 3D uh, tissues we can also lock in beads with cells to, to have a micro encapsulation of cells. And these two things we have done. Uh, one thing we're trying to understand and look in more to is the transfer, mass transfer properties of these materials because they have a very uh, large area to volume ratio as well as allow for a very controlled perfusion through the material. So we think that there's a good potential of these materials to be used for, for mass transfer problems. So that's all I'm going to say about LIMs. I'm going to move on to LISs now. So we have done much more work and we understand the surfaces better. And I'm going to mo mostly focus on, on uh, the fluid mechanics aspects of the surfaces. So an LIS, as I said, is basically a, a lubricant that is locked in a microstructure. And we're interested when these material surfaces are exposed to a fluid flow, right? So they have certain properties, these materials. For, for example, they have a slippery interface, right? So this gives the surface an anti-fouling function. So bacteria do not like to sit on liquid-liquid interfaces often. They rather compared to solid surfaces. So it's a good anti-fouling surface. In addition, when there is a flow, we have a finite velocity at the liquid-liquid interface, which gives us flow slippage, which means that we can use the surfaces for reducing friction or reducing drag. In addition, we can create, um, we can set in motion the lubricant and create a lubricant flow such that we can increase or modify mass and heat transfer of the surface from the surface to the bulk. And we can show that you can increase the heat transfer by 20% by tuning the thermal conductivity of the lubricant with respect to uh, the uh, solid. So there's all these neat functions that you can achieve with LIS. However, uh, usually in practice, the surfaces are non-ideal. We have contact land hysteresis, for example. Also, the flow field is not perfectly laminar 
and perfectly clean. So we have turbulence, fluctuations, in particular in larger scale systems, and we also have surfactants. It turns out that there is a very rich physics of the surfaces when we let go of these ideal assumptions and ideal settings to realistic uh, configurations. So I'm going to try to talk about this physics a little bit by you know, focusing on how different forces interact, right? So we have the hydrodynamic forces from the overlying flow on the surface. And basically the surface can react to these, to these exerted uh, hydrodynamic forces through capillary, uh, capillarity and um, surface tension variations, Maragoni forces. So we want to understand how interfacial phenomena, different kinds of phenomena are driven by these different forces. So this is what I'm going to talk about in the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the presentation. So let's start with the work by Sophia, a PhD student in my group, and she built a channel, which is three meters long and has a height of 10 millimeters. So it's a very special channel. And we have a one meter, of, one meter per second of water going through this channel. So we can create a significantly uh, turbulent flow, Reynolds number based on the bulk around 10,000. And then at the bottom of the test section, we install this uh, surface which contains the streamwise groups, right? Without any barriers. So these are just longitudinal grooves in the flow direction. And we fill them with hexadecane, right? And then we mix them also with fluorescent dye and use a camera from above to visualize the lubricant and the interface in the presence of turbulence. Now, I should say a little bit more about the surface. So we treated the surface such that, such that the lubricant wets the surface in the presence of water, right? So the contact angle is less than 90 degrees. And we have also contact angle hysteresis around 46 degrees. And so the surface prefers the lubricant over the water. And of course, under this, for this chemistry, if you put this uh, lubricant in a groove, it will spontaneously invade the groove, right? So there's an imbibition here. Uh, that's because the spreading condition is satisfied here. So there was, it, will, it will be a, a spontaneous invasion, right? So if we have this kind of chemistry, and then we look at, uh, we look at how the interface behaves under turbulent flow, we see that there's an initial de-wetting, and you know, and this, uh, these streaks are going to move slowly, but gradually there will be a complete drainage, right? So if we fast forward this for one hour and look how it looks like after one and a half hour, we can see that most of the oil, essentially all of the oil is actually drained. There's only a very, very thin film at the bottom of the grooves, right? So we have full drainage, and this is not so surprising because the shear from the overlying flow is basically dragging the oil with it downstream and causing drainage. All right. And what we did here is that we followed the fabrication rules of LIS. Clearly, if you want to uh, lubricate a surface, you should treat the surface such that the lubricant likes to wet, wet the surface. But we thought, why don't we try uh, to break the rules and create a lubricant that does not wet the surface, right? So we created a surface that where the lubricant only partially wets the surface, or actually the contact angle is larger than 90 degrees. So the surface prefers water over the lubricant. And we also have a very large contact angle hysteresis here, around 122 degrees, all right? So in this case, the spreading condition is not satisfied, which means that the lubricant will not spontaneously invade the group. Now, if we take again a look at how this, uh, uh, corresponding uh, uh, surface behaves under turbulent flow, we see again that there is a de-wetting initially, uh, similar to what we observed before. And, you know, there's some movement of these streaks or of this lubricant uh, droplets inside the surface. Now, if we fast forward, we see that we reach a steady state, right? So when we have a non-wetting or partially wetting lubricant, we can actually retain around 50% of the lubricant. So that is, of course, interesting. Uh, so we want to understand this. So we extracted uh, one of the shapes of one of these droplets inside the grooves uh, from our experiments. And we saw that it looks like uh, something like this. And of course, there's an advancing contact angle and a receding contact angle, uh, which we can define. And we also can. Um, 
define a pinning force, which is related to the contact angle hysteresis, the difference between the advancing and receding contact angle, multiplied by the surface tension and the width of the droplet, right? This is a pinning force. This is a force that resists the shear stress. So we can create a force balance here where we have the shear stress uh, pushing the uh, lubricant to the right, and this is then resisted by the uh, pinning force. So the question is, what kind of droplets can we resist? How long can they be? Because we can see here that the shear stress increases with the length, right? So the longer uh, the, 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 the shear stress uh, force, right? The force increases with the length. So there should be a critical length for which we can um, retain droplets, for which the pinning force is sufficiently large to resist the shear stress force. So we can define that by just balancing these two terms as this expression here, we have the surface tension over the um, shear stress multiplied by the contact angle hysteresis. We can do it better. We can actually solve for this lubricant analytically by solving the Stokes equation through eigenfunction expansion, making some assumption of the lubricant shape, of course, but we can get a more precise um, expression with a coefficient that only depends on the geometry, right? So we have this condition when when droplets are smaller than this critical L, they will stay in the surface. When they are larger, they will move and be drained, right? So we can check this, um, this uh, um, condition with our experiments. So here I'm showing you this L critical, how it varies with the shear stress. And we perform three experiments and we extracted from the experiments the maximum length of the steady droplets. And we see that the maximum streaks we see are pretty close to the critical length that we observed from the theory. So it turns out that we, you know, using a non-ideal surface, you can actually retain lubricants uh, by, by exploiting and using contact angle hysteresis of significant length. So millimeters are pretty large under, under rather large uh, shear stresses. So moving on, you know, in there's other aspects of, of uh, the turbulence, especially inertial forces that may affect the surface. So one work we did numerically with Yuan, my student that has graduated now, and also Stefan Saleski uh, from Sorbonne, is uh, that we looked at the capillary uh, waves. So what we did this time was direct numerical simulation. So we solved the Navier Stokes equations. Uh, for multiple components using the volume of fluid formulation. And we use the code called Paris, which Stefan uh, uh, initiated uh, some years ago. You know, and this is a snapshot of how the turbulent flow of a surface from a simulation looks like, showing you the positive and negative uh, fluctuations. And you can see the liquid infused surfaces and, and the interface here is moving and the contact angle is not pinned either. So, you know, this is as close as we can get in terms of numerical experiments. However, we have periodic boundary conditions. So there is no drainage in this case, whatever liquid, uh, lubricant that leaves the domain comes back in, right? So we can look at what happens when there is no drainage. We have viscosity and density ratio one. We have Reynolds number based on the bulk around 3000 and the Weber number in this case is 100. So the Weber number is also based on the bulk velocity. Right, so, you know, when we look at from top uh, on this Weber number 100 case, we see a rather tidy and neat lubricant. Indeed, it behaves as it should because we get a drag reduction, which is significant. So 10% drag reduction, which is great. Now, if we increase the Weber number by a factor of two, however, we see bulges and waves developing on the surface. And now, in fact, the drag reduction is completely canceled and we have drag increase instead. Right? So if we take a look at the center of these grooves, what happens, we can see that we have waves. So this is a Weber number 100 and Weber number 200. The difference is that, so this is the waves in the streamwise direction at different time instants, right? So what we can see is that we have way larger uh, uh, waves in terms of amplitude for Weber number 200 compared to Weber number 100. So we can also look at the amplitude, of course, and we see there's exponential growth of these waves, which you know tells us there's some sort of a in uh, some sort of linear instability going on here, and in particular, these waves grow so large in terms of amplitude, so they exceed outside of the viscous sublayer of the turbulent flow, basically creating a roughness effect, and therefore also increasing the turbulent uh, friction drag. 
Okay, so we wanted to again do some sort of uh, underst uh, understand this better and get conditions for when the, the, the lubricant can resist these uh, waves and when, when can it damp the waves and when will, will the waves grow. So we can again do a force balance so we can estimate that the force from the overlying flow is rho u squared, some sort of inertial scaling where u is some characteristic velocity. And then the capillary force here is gamma, the surface tension over the width here. So we assume that the, 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 uh, the width here is much smaller than the streamwise variation and the streamwise wavelength of, of the wave. So making you know uh, inertial capillary balance we can see that, yeah, okay, we can get, we may be able to balance the imposed uh, inertial force from the flow if the grooves are not too wide and if the surface tension is not too low, right? So this is just a force order of magnitude estimate. We wanted to be more exact. So we uh, used inviscid uh, linear stability and you have a semi-analytical solution where we get a way more complex uh, expression for the uh, in inertia capillary balance. So here we have other length scales, which are introduced by the turbulence, in particular, the viscous length scales that comes into play and also the friction velocity. So we can define a Weber number based on the friction velocity here. And it turns out that the width over the viscous length scale, when it equals this particular Weber number to the power of minus one over three, there is inertial capillary balance, right? So what this means is that if we plot this uh, asymptote, or if we plot this uh, power law in, in, in a width, normalized width with respect to this Weber number, we get a line and all the, uh, you know, all the choices we make such that the Weber number uh, and width, normalized width is in the gray zone, we will have waves that don't grow that much. This is what the theory tells us. Whereas in the upper right-hand side, we will have high amplitude waves and drag increase. So we can make numerical simulations where we see that the drag reduction cases do fall in into the small amplitude waves, whereas the high amplitude waves um, where drag increase uh, simulations fall into the upper side. So the theory seems to work, uh, especially uh, for small widths, right? Good. So the final thing I want to talk about, about the dynamics of the surfaces is related to surface tension variations, right? So one of the things that is never actually uh, true in reality is perfectly clean liquids, right? So there's always some particles and contaminants in the liquid, and usually they like to absorb onto interfaces. So these are surface active particles, what we call surfactants. So you want to look at this, and this has been studied in terms of in the context of super hydrophobic surfaces a lot. We wanted to understand this in terms of liquid infused surfaces. So what happens is that when you have surfactants in the bulk overlying flow, they absorb onto the interface, right? As you can see to the right, and then they are pulled downstream by the flow. So downstream of the cavity, you, where you have a stagnation point, if you like, you have a higher concentration of surfactants compared to upstream, which means that there will be a surface tension variation and there will be a Marigoni stress. And the Marigoni stress is directed in the negative streamwise direction. So it's actually opposing the flow field, right? So it's, it's trying to resist the flow. So this means that the drag reduction properties of the surface are reduced in the presence of surfactants. Now, what we wanted to do is to understand this. So we solve uh, the equations for a unit cell, the 2D equations, the steady Stokes equation to, for the flow, we're assuming this is a low Reynolds number case, the surfactant transport equation, both for the bulk, which is here given in C, and for, uh, for, the, sur for the interface. So surfactant concentration interface is big gamma. So we have uh, advection and diffusion for both of them. And then we also have a balance between the diffusive flux and S, and S is thus the kinetics, which is related to the adsorption and desorption, right? So this is the complete model, uh, continuum model of surfactants um, uh, um, uh, for this particular system. And also we are interested in the slip length here. The slip length is related to slippage, which, which I mentioned before. As you see, is the geometrical distance, which you have to extrapolate below the interface until you reach a velocity zero, right? A large slip length means a, a large drag reduction, low frictional resistance, right? So we want to see what happens 
with the slip length for different bulk concentrations of surfactants. So if we could look at the red line, which is for liquid-liquid interface, we can see that the slip length starts to uh, become smaller for surface uh, concentrations in the bulk around 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 4. And these are very low concentrations. We have also compared this to water-air interfaces, where you have, a, for example, superhydrophobic surface, where you can see that there's a large slip for, for these surfaces, but the drop in slip length occurs one order of magnitude uh, 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 lower in bulk concentration. So it turns out that LIS are way more sensitive to surfactants compared to superhydrophobic surfaces, right? So to understand this, we wanted again to take a look at the force balance. So we have the shear stress now uh, going to the right, and we can just say, you know, this is approximately given by some characteristic velocity U of the interface, near the interface, and B, which is the length uh, the slip length, right? So this is the distance which we have a uh, shear uh, rate, uh, U over B. So we can also say that the uh, Maragoni forces is re related to delta gamma, and delta gamma is deviation of surfactant concentration from equilibrium, right? So this is basically the variation, if you like, of the uh, concentration on the interface. So balancing these two, we get the expression like this. There's not much to look at. But if we rewrite it, we can see that slip length over the width of this cavity scales as one over the Maragoni number. And the Maragoni number MA is the ratio between Maragoni stress and shear stress, okay? So this means that when the Maragoni number is large, the Maragoni stress is large, we can get a slip, which is reduced to zero. This means that we have immobilized the interface and we have a no slip boundary condition, basically. Three minutes. All right, that should be enough. So one thing we have assumed so far is that there is a concentration gradient, right? However, of course, this concentration gradient arises because of transport processes. So we have to take into account different transport processes as well through a non-dimensional number. So we can look at the Peclet number here, which is basically the advection rate on the interface over the diffusion rate on the interface of surfactants. We can look at the bio, uh, BO number, which is the advection on the interface um, uh, over the adsorption and desorption rate. And we also have the Damkler number, which is the absorption desorption rate over the diffusion in the bulk. So these numbers also plays a role in how much the slip length is reduced. It's not only the Maragoni number. So when we do uh, some um, theory on this, we can, re I'm not gonna go into details, but what we can do, we can rewrite basically the slip length um, as a function of a parameter which contains both the Maragoni number and the transport process, in this case, the Peclet number in the insolubable limit, right? So assume there is no desorption adsorption, there's only uh, activity on the interface, we get the Peclet number, right? So I'm not you know, gonna go into detail, but you can also look at the bulk exchange controlled, uh, bulk um, exchange dominated system. And again, you get expression for the slip length that contains the Maragoni number, but also the transport uh, related non-dimensional numbers, in this case, BO number and dam color number, take into account the, uh, the other uh, time scales related to uh, transport. So, uh, you know, if you look at this a little bit more carefully, at the end, what we have to have is that we have to have the advection of surfactants on the interface dominate over all other processes, right? In that case, we can have a surface tension gradient. So we can again look at the theory how it compares to our simulations. So here I'm showing these two parameters that was somehow a lumped uh, version of Maragoni number and, and uh, transport uh, process, uh, non-emission numbers of transport processes. And we can see that in the lower corner where both of these numbers are small, we have the immobilized interface, right? In the right corner, we should have no effect on, on, the, um, on the interface. And indeed, if we do simulations and the colors here represent the slip length, so blue is completely immobilized, so no slip length. We have reduced, we have canceled all the slip length. We have, as, as according to the theory, this happens for small alpha S and alpha diff. On the other hand, when these numbers are large, we have no effects from the surfactants. So we can use the theory here to predict um, 
uh, the, the uh, knowing these non-dimensional numbers, we can predict the effect of surfactants for LLIS. So to summarize, I think these surfaces show enormously rich dynamics we really which need to uh, understand before we can you know, expect some sort of a technological breakthrough because they show a huge potential for controlling transport post processes in the bulk flow, but they're very sensitive to turbulence and, and contaminants. Right, just as to finalize, I would like to uh, acknowledge, of course, my group, this is uh, this is not everything I presented here, of course, is because of them. They've done the hard work. Also, my funding agencies here, and I'm also would like to uh, uh, you know make some shameless uh, 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 announcement that we have received an ERC to continue this work, and that will start first of September. Consolidated grant. So, if you're interested to know more, please come and talk to me. Basically, we are hiring. Yeah. So, so that's uh, thank you. Concept. Congratulations on the grant. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> questions, and please come forward behind these microphones and ask questions. Please, I encourage you all, please stand and ask any question related to this. Extremely interesting. We don't have time. Oh, yes, Major. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you. So there is a, so during the reception, when you pour wine, you typically get glugging, right? And so that usually can be due to a mass conservation between the air coming into the bottle mm -hmm. as the wine is being poured out. Mm -hmm. But that usually happens at very high flow rates. And so I'm wondering a couple of questions. One is for the high Reynolds number, you're looking at flow separation in terms of turbulence. That would lead to essentially a kind of a null point of the shear stress. Mm -hmm. Would you actually get something similar happening in your problem. The second thing is you tend to get that phenomenon as well when you have a viscosity mismatch between the fluids. So I didn't know if you had looked at the fluids where the viscosity mismatch was not near one, what would happen? So, so let me just understand the question. The question was, when you pour out wine, you're looking at, this is on the glass when you have the river? Oh no, in the, in the bottleneck. Yeah. So if okay, you, so as you pour the water out, out, you get yeah, glugging. Yeah, yeah, okay. And that's basically the water, the wine is actually kind of pinching off. Yeah. So and essentially, this is relevant. This is somehow related to. I, I'm suspecting it is. Okay. And then the second thing is you tend to get sort of these large deformations in the film shape if you have a very viscous film with a high shear stress on top, also based on a viscosity mismatch as well. So. All right. That sounds like a wonderful coffee discussion. I would like to have you <laughs> like that. Thank Great. you for that. For that, making quick questions. Please come forward. Oh, I should probably talk in the mic here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'm on the online also chat as well. Online people feel most welcome to post questions, please. Mm -hmm. Hello there. I just wanted to ask, uh, how did you change the wettability of the surfaces in the per first part of your talk? Oh yeah, through so, uh, basically a solution. So we're using a polymer which we call OST plus. And those are particularly simple to change the chemistry of. They've been designed, we use those instead of PDMS because they've been designed particularly for, for a very simple way of changing the chemistry. I'm happy to share those details with you. Yeah, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Last call for urgent questions. Uh, I have one quick one. Mm -hmm. You did not discuss about the contact of the lubricant with the solid wall. We What we observed, we were pretty much focused on the surface of the flow and this kind of shape, type of airfoil shape surface. I would assume that the, the interaction of the solid wall within these channels of lubricants would also play some role in here. What do you mean like inside the grooves? Yes, yes. Yeah, so how, how do you mean like the flow, flow, fluid mechanics or just the chemistry? We discussed about the force that would be exerted. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yes, absolutely. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a shear stress from uh, the yes. lubricant on the flow. That's correct. Uh, yes, and in our paper, we take that into account. Okay. I sort of. I must, will read your paper. Uh, yeah. then. I, 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 Let's uh, thank Shervin once thank more for this absolutely nice presentation. Okay. Now I am uh, delighted to introduce you uh, to uh, Julien Rosen from Thermo Fisher. Uh, Julien will give a five minute pitch about Thermo Fisher Scientific. Julien, please. Um, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for attending this uh, five minute pitch about our uh, software capabilities. Um, 
I'm glad to be here with you today to discuss about our software capabilities applied to the analysis of porous media. Um, as this year, Interpol focus is on energy transition. We will be addressing a use case on batteries. Uh, this use case will display some of our uh, software capabilities um, applied uh, for it. So uh, quickly before that, Uh, so I think I have the wrong presentation here. Uh, can we get uh, Julien's slide? Oh yeah, exactly. Oh yes, we have it. Yeah, exactly. Thank so, you. So here we go. Yeah. Sorry for this. So um, yeah, as I said uh, before, we address this use case. I'm just gonna give like in one side a quick uh, overview of our uh, company. So our company is Thermo Fisher Scientific, which is a world leader in serving science. Uh, with more than 100,000 colleagues worldwide and a strong commitment in R&D investments, uh, we enable our customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. But uh, now let's move back to uh, the use case uh, I won't be addressing today to present our software capabilities. So the way we will uh, present it, uh, we'll start with one slide describing the high-level issue reported by our partners. This is what we call the challenge. Uh, then uh, we will um, explain why this uh, challenge uh, challenges occur, which is what we call the problems reasons, and uh, describe the needed capabilities, uh, which is a description of an ideal solution for our partners. Finally, uh, we will uh, close the use case with uh, what we call the impact, which is the impact the implementation of that solution will provide. As um, in our today's example, uh, we'll be addressing, as I said, a use case on batteries to better understand our transport properties um, can um, are key in designing and manufacturing more efficient batteries. Uh, this includes simulation of uh, transport properties such as tortuosity. Um, in this case, a plasma fib was used for the imaging, allowing both high resolution and large field of view. Um, it is time consuming and complex to perform these lab experiments uh, to measure these properties. Our customer here needed a digital workflow to perform uh, a simulation of these lab experiments. So uh, the needed capabilities yeah, were like uh, the ability to perform this in a digital workflow in a simple way. Um, at the end, thanks to our full digital uh, lab uh, platform, uh, the simulation and the um, allowed our customers to perform yeah, the simulation directly from the images, resulting in important time savings. So um, we have taken one of our marketing videos uh, to show, to illustrate this case, showing uh, the steps in characterizing tortuosity in a solid oxide fuel cell. Um, the acquisition was performed using a plasma FIP and the correction of the pullback defect, which we'll talk about in the next slide, was done using deep learning. Once the segmentation is done, uh, we can characterize the space between grains and build a poor network model, which will then serve uh, to compute transport properties such as tortuosity. Uh, thanks to these capabilities, uh, simulation in a digital environment and the entire workflow are simplified and accelerated as in a single platform. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, I wanted to pose on this uh, pullback defect challenge that I've just mentioned. A typical challenge in uh, electron microscopy images um, is uh, the, the presence of pullback uh, effects. Uh, this is in scanning electron microscope images um, is written not only for the face of the specimen, but also for the back of the pores. Um, traditional image processing capabilities such, such as uh, thresholding, watershed, and topaz. Uh, tool will uh, show the true positive, but as well uh, the presence of pullback artifacts. Uh, this would cause inaccuracies in the estimation of porosity. Um, so using deep learning capabilities, it is possible to, um, to measure the actual porosity and to train a model that would predict this art to detect uh, artifacts in the sample. So in one minute, so yeah, basically to summarize uh, like this very condensed uh, use case, uh, what we have seen, um, so our software solution offer a comprehensive set of uh, tools that can allow you to uh, customize analysis workflow. Uh, they will allow you to go through everything from data import to uh, pre-processing of your images, visualization, 
segmentation and measurement and analysis and a presentation of your uh, results in a meaningful way. Uh, so from data acquisition to presentation and reporting and even simulation, uh, all these tools are available in a single environment. Uh, with that, also I want to, uh, to add that our software are agnostic of the data you are working with. So it means you can load like any type of uh, imaging data or any scale. And it was quick, but yeah, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, we have a booth uh, downstairs, so I invite you to come visit us if you have any questions about your um, image analysis projects. And uh, yeah, Fantastic. thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yoni. Excellent. Discussion in the booth, please. And this is the end of this session. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thank you.